right. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Fiona Maxwell. I am the Director of Museum Operations and Communications at the Francis Willard House Museum. Um, and I'm still letting people in, um, but I think it's time to get started. So uh, this program today is part of the Views program series uh, at the Willard House, which examines topics in women's history with new eyes. And we're excited to bring you this program series via Zoom as we can reach so many people and have speakers who may not live nearby. Um, and we are very excited to be welcoming guests from all over the world today. So um, the for those of you who do not know, the Francis Willard House Museum, uh, located in Evanston, Illinois, is the home of Francis Willard, a 19th century suffragist and social reformer. Willard was the longtime president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was the largest organization of women in the world by 1895. You can find out more about her home, Willard and the WCTU on our website. I'll put the URL in the chat. Uh, we are open for tours in the house and for research in the archives, and we welcome your visit both in Evanston and online, where we have lots of information on our website about our stories. If you don't already get our email newsletter, please be sure to go to our website and sign up and follow us on social media too. Uh, you can also make a donation on the website to support our work and this talk if you would like to. So I'll put a link to our donation page here in the chat as well. Uh, this program year, all of our programs will remain free, but we are encouraging those of you who are able to please make a donation today. And as I said, you can find the link in the chat. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, in order for us to create a video of this event to post on YouTube later, we have muted everyone and turned off the video feeds. Uh, we will have about 50 minutes of presentation and conversation and then some time for questions. Uh, we ask that you use the chat for questions. Uh, you can submit them as the talk goes along, and I will be monitoring the chat, and I will share your questions when we get to that time. We will be sharing the video later via our YouTube channel, um, so if you want to watch it again or send it along, um, you will be able to do that. So now, without further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Janet Olson, our head archivist, and thank you again for being here. Okay, so, uh, great. All right, I'm unmuted. Oh, uh, and uh, thank you, Fiona, for uh, running the uh, PowerPoint. Could you um, put up the first slide? Oh, here we go. Thank you. I uh, can't work without a PowerPoint. I need it. Um, anyway, thank you for joining us for this progress report on the Francis Willard House Museum and WCTU Archives um, ongoing project to document Black women's activism in the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU. Um, I'm Janet Olson, the archivist of the WCTU Archives and the coordinator of this database project. We've talked about and publicized it quite a bit over the past couple of years and I'm going to briefly outline it before uh, introducing my co-conversationalists, Carl Bullock and Adam Raskowski, who have contributed so much skill and energy and interest to, our, to make our progress possible. In early 2021, during COVID, um, we initiated a, an uh, a long-term project creating to create a research database to document the significant but underexplored role of Black women in the WCTU. The Black women of the WCTU project builds on the interest generated by our 2019 digital exhibit, which Fiona will show a slide of. Yes, uh, truth-telling about the conflict between Frances Willard and Ida B. Wells, which in addressed racism in the WCTU. And you can see the link uh, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the slide to, if you have not seen that exhibit, which has been quite, quite successful. It was an extensive 
project, and it was a joint effort of the museum and archives with support from Loyola and Northwestern universities and from our community. Our research for truth telling showed that black women had long participated in WCTU, but that their activism has been little studied by historians. The new database project is meant to change that by discovering the names of black WCTU leaders and the locations of black unions, the WCTU local branches uh, across the, new York, the United States, state by state. The, pub the publicly available database will provide information for researchers studying Black women's activism and their social networks. The final, final result will be a, a research resource rather than a site of storytelling and analysis. Our extensive records of WCTU unions at the national and state level provide the basic resources for the project. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Um, there are no national membership roles, even though the, uh, as many of us know, the WCQ was the largest women's organization of its time, uh, but they were, it was a de decentralized um, organization with no national membership database to refer to. So the most important resources we have for our research um, are the printed annual reports, which list officers at, at national, state, and local levels, uh, local union levels. These also report, these reports also report on national and local work. Other sources include reports and articles from the WCTU's publications. I will note that very few records uh, in our archives are digitized, one of the challenges uh, preventing faster progress on this. So in these examples, I'll just show a couple of things and I don't know if you can see the cursor, but anyway, our main source, as I said, is in the annual reports, there will be there uh, of the, at the state level, which are just like treasure troves, um, because they, WCT really kept good records. Um, and the state reports would show, their annual report would show uh, a directory of leadership in the individual unions and a city could have four or five unions. Uh, a small town might have one union, but um, they always listed the uh, the names of at least two or three of the officers, the president, the corresponding secretary, sometimes it's the treasurer. Uh, so you're getting, this is the resource for names of people and locations. And you'll notice, so from this example from the uh, WCTU uh, um, of Pennsylvania's report from 1885, and in this list of um, leaders in Allegheny County, and here we are in Pittsburgh, um, you can see this one is labeled, This the name of that particular union is the Colored Union, and there are two ladies mentioned here, Mrs. Betty uh, Parker and Mrs. Um, R.J. Smith. So we have two names of women who were involved. And then down here, there's another union in what Fort Perry, and it's noted as it's noted as Fort Perry number two. And usually if a union is labeled number two, that means it's a colored union. Um, sometimes it just means that there are, the city was so big that they or the town was big enough to support two unions, but usually they would have two different names. So very often, most often, the number two union in a um, in a in a town will be um, a colored union or a black union. Um, so we have two more names here. So this is how we gather the the names. Uh, the other places we find things in our sources are also within the annual reports from the states. For example, back in in um, Pennsylvania from 1885, in addition to the directory of unions, which goes on for multiple pages because Pennsylvania has a ton of counties uh, and a lot of towns. So, uh, but uh, the report, the rest of the report will report on the individual departments. And you'll see here uh, the report given by, um, given for, for the Department of Work Among the Colored People, which was the main name for 
of the black unions, uh, the department heads of the black unions. And you'll see that the, this, in this case, the superintendent was Frances E.W. Harper, a very, very well-known woman in uh, the as a, a black activist, poet, writer, orator, and she worked as she was the superintendent for the WCQ for a number of years. And within her report, which is a multiple page report in this case, there are other names mentioned of women who have established unions or women who have done some work. So there is a source for names too, as we search the narrative, as well as searching through what looks more like you know, a list or an inventory or something that can be e more easily indexed. And then one last thing, uh, one other place we can find names in the uh, WCTU archives is in the, the various publications, including the Union Signal newspaper, which was the paper of, newspaper of record. Uh, and they report on all different kinds of things. And here in 1916, they're reporting on uh, the formation of a um, the Lucy Thurman Union in, in uh, Syracuse. And Lucy Thurman was another of the very well-known, one of the well-known uh, Black women who was involved in the WCTU, but not necessarily known. She's known for many other things other than that, but she was very uh, involved in the WCTU. And the union was named, a number of unions were named for her. And then there's also, it mentions, oh, look, Syracuse Union Number 2 and Mrs. C.J. Clark. So this is how the information gets uh, sort of gathered. Um, so you can see that it is, is time consuming and, and you look at a lot of places and there's re a lot of reading between the lines. So as we developed the new project, um, as you can imagine, we spent a lot of time testing and refining the best practices for gathering these names and um, ensuring that we were citing each citing and documenting each source for each piece of information so that people could go back to it uh, and that we could double check and it leads you to more things. Um, so let's see, let's go to the next slide, Fiona. Thank you. Um, so here's an example of, as we've gathered names from Illinois, uh, which is actually the one we've done the, the most work on because we have so much from Illinois. And we really spent the entire summer uh, completing the inventory of, uh, of the state reports from, Ill from Illinois. Uh, and so this is just shows just a few of the fields that we collected. And there are a lot more across our spreadsheet with a source for each one. Um, and uh, you'll notice one thing I'll just point out here, of course, anybody who's done genealogical work um, or <laughs> done a lot of exploring in, in, in uh, women's history knows that um, I didn't, sometimes figuring out the person's name is not so easy because here we have um, Mrs. James Hudson, but we were lucky enough to find out that Mrs. James Hudson was also Emma Hudson. So many times women are listed as with their husband's name. So, um, which adds an extra step to our um, confirming who, who they were, getting the, the rest of the information. So I just wanted to mention that um, as one of the, the many interesting challenges. And you'll see we, what we've got for her is you know, where she was from, uh, where this, very important, what the source was, the report, annual report for 1922, uh, that she was the treasurer in the union named Aurora Frances Willard. Once again, and if you look down this list, this gives you a little bit of an idea of the names that the unions would take. Um, if they weren't identified as colored, um, they might be named after Elizabeth Peterson, Lucy Thurman, um, who were also uh, Black leaders. Uh, Elizabeth Peterson was um, from uh, Texas. And then there's Galesburg number two. And then Frances Willard. Very often uh, a union was named after Frances Willard. So um, let me see. Is there anything else I wanted to say about that? Um, okay. So 
And we also consult non-WCTU sources, even though we have a ton of WCTU sources, state reports. But um, the non-WCTU uh, sources are mostly digitized, and they include the federal census records, Ancestry.com, biographical databases, and digitized Black newspapers. There are so many, there's so much information available now that has not been before. Um, it's just great. So we rely a lot on these other sources to confirm the data that we're gleaning from the uh, records in the reports, in the annual reports. As Adam and Carl will tell you, one of our challenges is to verify that the individual listed is actually Black since the WCTU records don't often specify race for individuals. And often white women were the department heads at the state and national levels. So at the national and state levels of a the Department of uh, Work Among the Colored People, you uh, we we have to verify whether they were black or white. If they're if it's a local union and you find the president and the treasurer, it's 90 99% sure that that woman is black. So anyway, we do, um, Adam and Carl will tell you more about that process. So, and just to give a hint as to how the database will be used by researcher, researchers, and with a nod to the expanding field of digital humanities, which loves to graph and map and analyze and network and all that stuff. Here are a couple of examples uh, done by Adam who um, using just the small amount of data we have currently gathered, as you can see, um, th this one, the one on top, it, which shows the number of African-American WCTU unions founded by year, that was done, uh, Adam did this one uh, when we had maybe like 500 names total for the whole country. So um, this is just the, the slightest like the tip of the iceberg. But it really shows you what you can, the kinds of things you can learn from treating these, um, uh, treating archives as data. And then there's a graph. Two, these two are done uh, based on Illinois, since that's a more complete set of uh, people that we've gone through. And we have the number of Black unions in Illinois uh, from 1898 to 1950 by year. Um, and then over here, the, this map on, on the right-hand side is the counties, Illinois counties with Black unions from 1898 to 1950. Um, he's also, we've also done things like, well, when were they most, uh, how many unions per county and when were they most, uh, most at their most active, et cetera. But this is the kind of thing that we can foresee happening a lot, the more information we gather. And um, it, it gets kind of exciting when you, you, you see these lives taking shape. Uh, and as I've said, um, the, the project is specifically intended to provide data for research so that we can do things like this. And, but there are, um, we can't help getting sidetracked by the women whose lives we, whose names we discover and um, getting a little bit interested, trying not to go down the rabbit hole too much. But there are many stories we have come up with as, as this research is going on, just from the little bits of information that we find uh, in the state reports and in, um, uh, uh, in the newspapers and, and other sources. So in, at the top on this slide, you can see the, our, our banner. We've been using this banner for a couple of years, which is uh, which shows some of the women who are much more well known um, in uh, you know if a, much more well known, even though their work in the WCTU is not necessarily known, but they are women that you might have heard of. Um, Amanda Barry Smith, uh, Lucy Thurman, Frances D.W. Harper, Sarah Early, Rosetta Lawson, all of these women were uh, very active in their churches and na at national levels in, in suffrage and um, working for uh, uh, 
women's rights and and um, for African American rights, etc. But you don't necessarily think of them as WCTU women, and so that's part of what we're uncovering is the number of women who were involved in the WCTU and 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 the questions that will come up will be we hope we'll get some things about um, you know what was it about the WCTU that these women uh, which drew these women in. And uh, so that, let's see, yeah, right. So, um, so the, some of these pictures, this picture, this one's from the Union Signal, the WCTU newspaper. And the others come from a couple of, of the historical black newspapers. This is from a book. This one over here is a book showing, um, what was it called? The end of the saloon or something like that. It was a history of prohibition. And there's a section on black women who participated in the WCTU. So there's a there's a everywhere you once you start looking, the the seeking the information is so fun and challenging. So our next steps include developing a crowdsourcing program to move the work along more quickly so that we can get a usable prototype up online. Um, we'll talk more about the challenges later, but aside from staff and funding, we face two obstacles. Most of our on-site resources are not digitized, and we do not have complete sets of annual reports from all states, although we know where additional volumes reside. Uh, a last word is that we couldn't implement our ideas without the help of volunteers, interns, and other supporters. So. You'll see this totally unstaged photo uh, from last summer. And in addition to Adam and Carl, uh, there's, uh, um, I want to thank uh, our other summer workers, which included Chloe Rabaki, uh, Liz Morris, and let's see, uh, in the, starting back in the spring of 2021, we had our intern, Livy Schmidt, who did foundational research. And summer 2021 intern, Amelia Perkins, who powered through a ton of national material. And I have to really thank the grad students from Loyola, Loyola University's History 487 class, who did an incredible amount of work in the spring of 2022. Also, many thanks to our advisors and our fans for interest, comments, and enthusiasm. And now uh, we will meet. Adam and Carl, and get started with the conversation. So, um, let's see. Yes, I will introduce them now. Adam Raskowski was last summer's University of Chicago grad global impact intern at the WCTU archives. He graduated from the University of Chicago uh, with a master's in the social sciences in August 2022 and currently works for Crane Communications doing survey market research. He has a deep background in history and much experience in project management. And he's been helping the WCTU archives as a volunteer and or intern since January of 2022. Tara Bullock is a second year PhD student in the rhetoric, media and publics program at Northwestern University. His research interests include the rhetoric of political and social movements within Black communities. Specifically, he's interested in how sports has been an area of dissent for Black athletes and what its rhetorical power and constraints have been by analyzing the sports arena through a historical and contemporary lens. So, Carl and Adam, unmute yourselves and let's get started here. I'll start with a basic question. So, and one of you can start and then you can join in. Uh, describe how you got involved in this um, project, in the Black Women in the WCT project, and um, why it seemed interesting to you. So, who wants to go first? Adam? Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm lucky enough to live in Evanston. So I sort of stumbled upon uh, the WCTU and the archives by passing the Willard House often enough and finally going up reading the plaque. And then I reached out and got a, got a tour and that kind of got me everything started. It was also, as uh, Janet mentioned, I was going to 
University of Chicago at the time. And it sort of met that need of like, oh, there's an archives. Let me see if I can volunteer, get some more of that archival research background and like know how an archive works. But that was coinciding with, I had sort of decided to leave history a bit more behind and work more with data. And so I kind of um, stumbled upon <laughs> This, uh, this project. And of course, uh, as soon as I heard database, you know, then I started thinking visualizations and all that stuff. So that just, I never looked back after uh, after we got going. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Carl. And uh, I got involved uh, with the Francis Wheeler House because through Northwestern's um, Chicago Humanities Initiative internship program uh, through the, uh, through the um, Center for Civic Engagement which allows graduate students like myself in the humanities to explore other professions outside of academia that deal with public facing scholarship. And I've always been interested in museums and the capacity to tell stories because I'm a journalist by trade. I love the art of storytelling. And I think history is told in museums. It gives a little comprehensive and more nuanced look at how we get to certain moments in our um, society. And I, the, the Francis Willard House was really kind of like one of the only two sites that offered the ability to dive into the archive. So that's what drew me to it. Yeah. Okay. So when, when once we've got you uh once you got got you into the archives, what uh, what did you what was your role in this, what has your role been in this project and how did it fit with your skills and your interest? And I'm sorry, I guess we didn't talk yes. before who was going to go first. So I'll. Oh, <laughs> I'll jump I'm in just going to. And we're going alphabet, alphabetical order. My okay. first name. Sounds good. First name. Okay, that's important. Um, so, yeah, my role was uh, in working with Janet and sort of once we, like, okay, here's what the project is. What can we do this summer? And kind of designing that, redesigning the database a bit, a little bit, because Amelia had done so much work. And it was looking at what she had done, what sources has she looked over, is there information that would have been nice to have had when she was doing it? And so it was building out the database a little bit more. And then as the summer project got rolling with, uh, especially, you know, with somebody as good a researcher as Carl on board, it's like, oh, what's the stuff that I didn't think about or Janet didn't think about? And what do we need to add in? And how does that database grow a little bit as we're doing it? And as we're searching to, as you, Janet, you were saying, verify the names. And so it's once that research project got going, it was more that like, hey, how can we guide the, the research along as well as what are the best practices? Let's record those. Let's turn that into a report. So for the next group that keeps doing it, here's best practices and they can create even better practices going forward. Yeah, and we one thing um, I have to say, Adam, you helped a lot in when we when we had the Loyola students and we had an entire, uh, what was it, 18 people um, working um, for a class project in doing some of this research. And so we used them to really test out the gathering methods and what is the best way for them to do it. Is it in a spreadsheet? Is it in a data form? Is it a, a Google form? No, uh, that does not work. But, um, you know, seeing how they figured out, you know, how what their process was gave us a lot of good information about how we could streamline and write up a, a, a manual on how to do the research and what you expect to find and all that stuff and, and making sure that the, there's a standardization and um, that, of course, citation, citation, citation. So. Yeah, that was a pretty resounding no from the Loyola students on Google Forms. So that was very helpful. You were right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we were going to, you know, we did too many questions and it takes too much time to fill it in on a, a, a Google Form. And we went back to a uh, spreadsheet. So I don't know what it's going to look, you know, gonna look, which is going to really going to resemble what the, the final database looks like. So it's kind of a good way to do it. So Carl, you spent a lot of time on that database, filling in that spreadsheet. Yeah, so my role uh, at the Francis Willard House was going through our those state reports in Illinois, those annual reports, locating, identifying which unions were uh, identified as being Black unions, writing down the names of those individuals listed at 
different roles from the president to the secretary to the treasurer, um, writing down their addresses, and then cross-referencing all that information with the Ancestry.com database to look at the U.S. Census records, find out you know, what the race was annotated in the U.S. Census for these women, just to confirm whether they were Black or white. As you mentioned earlier, uh, Janet, some white women were department heads of these unions, so we did run into that uh, sometimes. But my job was to go in and confirm uh, through those databases whether these women were Black or white, also to cross-reference through Northwestern's um, historical newspaper database to see if we could find any information that further helped uh, confirm that information for us. So that was kind of my role. And the way the way it fit in with my the way my interest the way that fit in with my skill set and interest was that as I mentioned before I'm naturally uh, a journalist I worked in journalism before I'm always curious as to how one's life experiences shape their political and social activities and that would made me really curious and made me really kind of like enthralled by this project to just dive in and see uh, wh who these women were and what they did. Yeah, yeah, and. Um and where they were located. And we, we discovered a lot of things to, with this big focus on Illinois that we will see carried through in, in, in other states of, of where the unions are formed. And it tells you a lot about, uh, it, it gives you good information about um, how a, you know, how the, the state is populated. Where are the black counties and, and areas and how does that relate to, of course, that relates a lot to how many Black WCTUs there will be. And, and we discovered um, some interesting things in, in Illinois. Uh, Adam, if you want to mention a few um, things we learned about sort of the, the demographics as, as we worked on Illinois. Yeah, because we were started in starting in the late 19th century, kind of picking up where Loyola students had left off. And Carl and Chloe kept finding all these um, potential unions because we were still de dealing with, we, they hadn't yet called out which were black unions and which weren't, but that we had the, what we thought might be. And we were finding a lot of them in like Southern Illinois down on like the Mississippi, Ohio you know, River where they come together. And that just got us, you know, thinking about, you know, we live in modern Chicago land. So it's like, oh, clearly we should only find them in Chicago. So we went and looked up uh, sort of the census data and that showed us that starting in the late 19th century when we were looking that actually the African-American popul black population was much greater in Southern Illinois than it was in Chicago at the time. And then, you know, oh, as you keep looking census after census, that, that switches, but we could create, you know, like heat maps for the uh, popu black population in Illinois. And that kind of helped us guide us, like Carl was saying, to find out like, oh, is this likely, you know, an African-American individual or is it, you know, just, oh, we were wrong about guessing whether this union was a black union or not. Yeah. So, um, so one thing we can talk about is, you know, you've, we've talked a little bit, we've implied a little bit about the challenges and it's not, you know, it's, it's not just like looking down the list and because there are a lot of things like, oh, spellings change. Uh, it depends on who was this who was uh, taking the notes that day and who remembered to send the reports in. I mean, anybody who's done research uh, in organizations and even in institutions knows that there is a lot of inconsistency and you have to be sort of mentally flexible as you say, well, okay, in Illinois, in the, this set of years, the record keeping was really good, and then here it's bad, and uh oh, we suddenly were we're missing a volume. We don't have 1914 for one reason or another. So there's a lot of you know uh, a lot of challenges in just um, not in, in interpret interpreting the information and really getting a consistent look at it because it does change from year to year and you suddenly wonder, well, what, wait a second, what happened here? And we discovered that in the, I think in the 1920s, uh, is the, the demographics changed a lot and the, the number of unions you know, fl can fluctuate a lot based on say um, one particular leader or um, one, you know, one particularly dynamic leader and also what else is going on? What other things are people involved in? So I think, um, you know, for, for one, let's see, um, 
there were things like uh, different pe people who would be, you could see something like, uh, like um, Eva Dean, Adam's favorite person, because she was um, a very dynamic leader who, for a long time in Champaign, right? Was it Champaign or Springfield? Yeah, Urbana-Champaign, and she was a state organizer and the superintendent for work among the colored people in Illinois from like 1920 to 1926. And when we were looking at that graph earlier, we saw that big spike in the number of unions for a little while. That's basically when Eva T. Dean was in charge. She was, you know, a mover and a shaker and, and made things happen. Um, but just that interesting, you know, dynamic of the, well, before I got started in this, I would never have thought Urbana-Champaign would have been a hotbed of um, leadership for the uh, Black women at WCTU, but she came out of there. And then the woman uh, who took after her, I think, eight, I want to say H.G. Wells, but it's not H.G. Wells, uh, but it is Mrs. Wells, uh, who then took over for that union in that county for another, it seemed like 20 years or so. Um, but you were also mentioning the, uh, the record keeping. And about 1930, all our assumptions about what we knew was, you know, an identifier for a black union in the records disappeared. So it looked like in theory, all of a sudden, all the black unions evaporated in the thirties. Um, and it actually took um, us looking into the Cook County records who, because whoever was taking the records for them actually did a better job and could we could still identify them that way. So it's that going through the archives and looking at every angle you can to, and you know, the, the history detective work uh, that was so fantastic. And speaking, of course, of history detective work, um, Carl got to spend the most time with like the census and ancestry.com and trying to verify uh, the race of the individuals involved so we could have some confirmation. And that led to some uh, pretty interesting things, didn't it, Carl? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, funny that you mentioned that because I was just seeing a question in the chat regarding something like this about some of the, the things that were very difficult. So one of the things that's very difficult um, and that Adam brought into the conversation that we had about over the summer regarding race in the U.S. Census from 1870 to 1950 was that it was very vague about whether or not they allowed people to identify for themselves what their race or ethnicity was. It very, it, it very much there were instructions uh, telling enumerators how to um, annotate race when they uh, were recording it for the individual. So there were at times where they, you know, they were very specific about how race was very scientifically driven. So mm -hmm. if somebody looked like they had a drop of black blood, then that would annotate for them, like, oh, no, they are black. Uh, then, and even if somebody was, they used the term quadroon and octoroon, whether somebody had a grandparent who was black or a great grandparent who was black, that would signify for them to tell them to annotate it as, at them as black on the US census. So that was some of the difficulties and challenges that we ran into was that, and then we also saw with certain individuals, the race would go from, I know for one for one person, for instance, uh, I'm thinking of Elizabeth Bell, who was living in Kane County in Aurora, uh, from 1910 to 1920, her race went from black to mulatto. Um, in the US census, they specifically stated that mulatto means black. Uh, there were other cases where the race went from black to mulatto to white. Um, so it, it really showed that it, they were very vague and just inconsistencies in which how they annotated race, which made it very challenging. But, um, you know, we would still kind of like try to adhere to that. Like, how was it annotated? And whether and if they were a part of that union that we identified in the state reports, the address matched up, that we can at least say it's very much possible that this person was black. And not that we are saying it definitively, but maybe this allows us to kind of like search for this person further in the archive. Does she come across in newspapers? Does she come across in any convention reports? Um, and that that's some of the kind of like difficulties, difficulties that we had, but it was just like a starting point in building out that database further to try to, you know, recover the, the voices of some of these Black women who might have been working and organizing and, you know, but it was very much interesting, but it's one of the challenges that we kind of like approach over and over again. Yeah, because I know I, I seem to remember if I got the year right when we were looking at the uh, instructions to enumerators in the census. It wasn't until I think 1950 where we could sign, find any reference to them being told to ask somebody what their race was. <laughs> so it was, yeah, that weird, oh, you can tell, <laughs> which obviously looking at them year after year, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's. 
um, we we learned a lot of things. We explored a lot of things we we didn't know were part of this kind of information gathering thing. Um, as as Adam was saying, uh, I mean, he looked in he he and Carl and Chloe looked into the you know the, the rules for census takers and you know, looking at different things in the the census and then comparing that with what you might find in ancestry in the. Um, uh birth and marriage and death certificates thing and just seeing you know how to figure out who we were trying how to find the people we were trying to find so so what do you um so what was well we know what was many of the challenges and what was surprising what was the most meaningful thing that um that the either of you had discovered in doing this or unexpected thing, aside from the unexpected thing of doing a project like this. <laughs> um, I guess for me, it was, you know, through the lens of EBT Dean, because I went down that the EBT Dean rabbit hole, uh, and I'm still down there. And it's, it's a great place to be. Uh, it was just the, the and I guess I, I hadn't thought about it before I started this project. So it's probably mostly, you know, everyone else will be like, yeah, of course, that's what it is. Uh, but just that intersectionality, you know, again, of everybody involved, because you got, you know, religion mixed with politics, mixed with race, mixed with mixed with morality, um, and the fact that, you know, hey, somebody like Eva T. Dean, who was involved in the WCTU, had another life and was involved in lots of other projects. She was with the Household of Ruth, which was the Grand Union of Odd Fellows. She did that kind of around the First World War, and then she was very involved in like Baptist leadership throughout uh, Illinois. And so it was, you kind of get a little picture of, hey, here's somebody who liked being an organizer and would go, you know, and would kind of be an organizer, you know, wherever she felt she was needed or whatever she was interested in. So that, that rounding out a little bit of the picture of that, you know, oh, this isn't just a name in some state report, you know, there's, there's living and breathing people here. And again, yeah, like I said, I everyone else probably knew that. <laughs> Well, but when you see it, when you're actually doing the work and you're going through, you know, going through a state report, 100 pages of state report, and these names come out and you find the individual women, it's really kind of exciting. And that the thing, um, uh, the part of the intersectionality things, um, when you're looking at these networks, if you're looking at networks of women, I think this database, the whole, what we're hoping for, this database will plug a whole set of women in to networks, social networks that that um, was not known about. We know, um, you know so many of them were involved in their church and the uh, um colored women's clubs and many other organizations you also see them getting involved in suffrage which of course was a big part of the wctu's work also but moving on into you know moving from uh uh temperance to, to suffrage um and thinking that even though you know these these women may be it was these were segregated unions and there were challenges certainly there um and looking it's going to point out i think as people do research using this these our database um you'll be able to see you know who had who had the power who had the agency whose idea was this whose idea was that and that the uh as as you both pointed out i mean you can see these women gaining leadership experience through uh, the WCTU, and um, so that despite whatever, despite you know, discrimination and things that would happen in turn in within the the WCTU's you know, system, um, that they were getting uh, that um, they were taking a, taking agency and um, bettering their communities in their ways in their you know in the way that would work for their community rather than having it run by these white women so carl um what was most what was most interesting um i think the most interesting thing for me was as someone who was interested in archival research um and diving into it is the process of 
building a, a research database that is not only credible, but holds existing knowledge accountable. Um, and I think that this is like, you know, trying to figure out like, how does that happen and doing it from scratch? Like it's a long process. And there are times where you might find something that looks very fruitful and you're, you start on this path and then you reach a dead end. And, and, but that doesn't mean that that's, that it's the end. Um, but you, you might need to cross-reference again, something else. You might need to do a little, a little bit more digging. Um, but I think, you know, the ways in which like the archive can be built up as a credible research, a uh, credible resource, and something that I found very meaningful because I think what it does is, I think what something like the Truth Telling Project does is it causes, you know, us as researchers to not foreclose um, any of our existing knowledge about history. Um, and, to, and that how research is uh, is continuous. It, it keeps expanding, it keeps going, is and it's it's always there. You just it may it may not be right in front of you, but you might just have to just come across it to just dig it up. Um, so that's the part that I found most meaningful and like very uh, valuable for me as a researcher. Yeah, yeah. I, I've certainly it's been um, we've had some very fun and interesting and um, inspiring conversations in the archives. And this is one of these things. This is what's fun. Um, what's what's really you know meaningful really in, in doing this kind of research is when you start talking about it. You say, "Oh, look what I found," and Chloe says, "Oh, but." What about this? And why is it this way? So we, we do a little looking. Oh, okay, well, that explains why it's documented in this way. And what does that mean? What else do we need to know in order to be able to assess this information? It's it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a dynamic, um, you know, archives are dynamic. They're much more dynamic than you think. So... Is there anything else we should? Uh... Yeah, I'm popping in now um, because it's time for our Q&A. We've got quite a few questions in the chat. Um, and before we kind of dive into some of the, the meteor questions, we've had some requests for some resources based on what you presented in um, the PowerPoint and also what has been going on in the conversation. Um, so I think, Janet, maybe some of these resources we could include in a follow-up email but um, to attendees. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the resources people are curious about is if there's a digitized access to the union signal. Um, and uh, if also it's possible to access Adam's charts on the number of black unions. Um, and also the book that contains the section about black women in the WCTU where you had the images, um, which you call the end of the saloon. Um, but I think some participants are having trouble locating it. So sources like that, if there's- Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Mm. Yeah. So, if you just have any tips about accessing those resources or if we can make them available after the fact, I think we can make them certainly make them available. Um, we're, we've got sort of a running bibliography going of, of things that we're using kind of internally because this database, much as we want it to be out there for people to use, it's, it is very slow going in collecting all these names state by state, and especially if we're missing volumes or they don't record things. So um, we want to make it as complete as possible before we put it out, but certainly we can make the resources that we've used for our secondary sources uh, available. And that book is called P The Passing of the Saloon. It's from 1908. Uh, I just remembered the name of it. Um, we can list those. We have a web page um, on the Francis Willard House Museum and Archives uh, website um, that talks about our project. And I think it would be a really good idea if we add in a bibliography, which is, um, I think we can do that. So that is a great suggestion. So for either either of the other two, Adam and Carl, do you have any other uh, comments on, on that? Oh, I would just say that those a lot of those visualizations are on that same website, the Black Women in WCTU section of the Francis Willard House website as part of the report we did at the end of the summer. Uh, so you can see the visualizations there. Excellent, yes, I put the link to that in the chat. So that is should be able to be accessed. Um, so um, moving on to some other questions. Um, 
First, we've been asked when you anticipate being able to move beyond Illinois' borders. Um, we have a guest who is from New Hampshire and found um, a, a union there that was fascinating. So yeah, I think we um, have some curiosity from other states. Uh, well, we've certainly moved into some other states. Uh, the Loyola Project worked on four different states, uh, and we've done a little looking. Uh, somebody asked me about Texas and Louisiana a little while ago, so we're kind of doing it, you know, um, as as people ask. Plus, we did a lot of work sort of at the national level, so we know who a lot of the department superintendents were nationally and at state level. So um, we do have some, I guess, uh, assorted information about a lot of different states. Uh, this is kind of our, our, our biggest challenge is we are small staff, we're all part-time, uh, or volunteer, and to work through this information, it, it takes longer than you expect. Um, and I wish we could move faster. I wish we had more people to work on this. I wish we could make it more of an interactive thing because yeah, if somebody knows about um, a union in New Hampshire, we want to add it to the database. And then if there are more in New Hampshire, we want to be able to tell somebody about that. I don't feel that we're ready yet to do make anything public because we have just such, such, such a smattering of information. Um, I don't know, I might be too cautious about that, but we don't have really enough to produce something yet, but uh, we're moving toward that. And we definitely want to hear from other people if they know of uh, unions or if they want to know about unions. Thank Did you. that answer the question? And yeah. Carl and Adam, anything else on that? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, uh, one of the things I got very excited about because I went and looked around and looked at, like, oh, where are what other states or universities or archives have like a, a good run? Like, you know, here we have a good run in Illinois. Who else has like a good run? And one of them was Nevada. Like, their state archives, like, it looked like they had almost the entire run of annual reports. Um, two things came up pretty quickly. Um, the reports are like pamphlets, they're like tiny. So I thought, again, I'm like, oh, this is very good. Someone can really whip through those. Uh, and then Janet was like, well, should we look up the census population? And we did, and no African-Americans really lived in Nevada, uh, you know, until much later after the, like, the scope of our thing, we were finding like three people in the county. So I was like, oh, okay, it's probably not worth spending time looking at Nevada right now. Maybe that's, you know, a, a, you know somebody can back clean up couple years down the road. And then I know Liz, who uh, also worked with us over the summer and is still going, started looking at Tennessee and all of a sudden the record keeping is different and the techniques that worked in Illinois no longer work in Tennessee. And so she's not uh, having as much wonderful success as she did uh, finding names in Illinois. Yeah. Yeah, and um, oh yeah, and uh, yeah, Adam did a lot of work on uh, locating uh, archives and uh, research libraries across the country that do have uh, uh, some of the uh, state reports that we do not have. Of course, the big problem there is that just like with our material, none of these are digitized. So it makes it, you know, figuring out how to work with that, how to get additional people working with us, how to get uh, do work that's do work remotely when nothing is digitized. These are questions that because uh, there are many, many uh, wonderful crowdsourcing projects that that work basically in indexing um, and uh, documenting this kind of thing for digital humanities purposes and for the same kind of results that we're trying to get to, but they're mostly working with digitized materials. And so that's a big problem for us. Yeah. Um, one question that we have also is, were there mixed race unions? Are you aware of any? Yes, there were. Um, I don't know, Carl and Adam, did you run across any? I mean, could you tell? But I know that there were some. I mean, Michigan had some. There are others. And in later years, there were mixed. I and mean, if you get into the 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, there were more mixed 
race um, integrated um, unions, but uh, for earlier ones, I don't know, Carl and Adam, did you find any in Illinois? Uh, Carl, yeah. you did a little more. <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to ask if you want me to go. Um, yeah. So based on the, um, the diving in of the state annual reports that I did from starting off from like 1870 up until about 19, 20, 19, 30, anytime we ran across the union where like the president, secretary, treasurer, who, these were the only officers that were listed in their unions. They didn't, they didn't specify anything in the annual reports about the um, make, racial makeup of their membership. But anytime we came across like those officers, um, when we came across the, whether they were white or black, um, it was never mixed. So I'm, I'm unable to really say definitively if there were mixed unions during that time, but uh, all indications point that they were not. But again, it's really hard to tell because they never described the racial makeup of their unions. It was literally, they just listed the officers and then that was it. And when I would do the search on ancestry.com, or just like trying to go through historical newspapers to try to figure it out, um, it never came back as if they were mixed. It was always like the president was white, the secretary was white, the treasurer was white, but we, other than that, we had no other indication. And that's like just a kind of like the ongoing process is trying to figure out what the unions look like. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. If I couldn't really say definitively if it yeah. was, I'm trying to figure that part out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we'll learn more about that because there were, I think what we need to do is to identify some uh, integrated unions and see how they're described and, and all that. So, yeah, there's there's much more work to do on that. Yeah, I think we have time for maybe a couple questions, uh, one or two more questions, and I'm going to kind of combine these. We had some questions about um, that kind of also relate to this sort of um, demographic data. Um, one of them being, um, are there ways beyond the census for identifying a person's race and ethnicity? Um, and also, have you done any tracking about age, um, given that um, there might be kind of a graying of the membership over time um, or comparing the size of unions? So those are some different categories of demographic data that people are interested in. Carl, do you want to talk about the first one, first part of that question about like the different sources? Yeah, when it comes to... Uh race and so in the state annual reports as janet also pointed out in her presentation like they would annotate whether that union was colored or not or black or not um but outside of the census we had no other markers of identification and how to tell someone's race or ethnicity which is why we tried to you know go to historical newspapers to see if there were conventions uh like we've running across like whether frederick Douglass spoke at a wctu convention or not just trying to find the names that might let us know or give us some type of um, kind of like any kind of like identification where we could make that determination, but we did not come across it outside of the census. Um, so unfortunately, no, at this time, did not have any other source, but that because that was the that was our way in which we were trying to identify them, but we didn't we had no other sources um, when we we're doing that research. Yeah. Yeah, and then in terms of kind of the more demographic stuff, um, ob obviously it's just a bunch of names in the state record, so they don't give you an age. So it was, again, through the census that we could find out some of that information, like Eva T. Dean, who I keep bringing up, uh, looking at the census, when she was working with the WCTU uh, in Illinois, she was in her 40s. Uh, when she was with the Household of Ruth in her 30s, you know, and she and kept going from there. Um, so that's, you know, one anecdotal uh, bit of information. And what was the other part of the question, Fiona? I'm sorry, I had um, it and I lost if it. If there's any tracking of different sizes of unions. Yeah, thank you. And, and Chloe, who was working with us over the summer, started to do that because in the, uh, you know, they've got the lists of officers and then they also have like the dues paying members in a different part of the annual reports. So Chloe was tracking that a little bit, but we haven't really looked at that in a, in a systematic way. And it seemed to be, you know, sometimes there were enough people basically to fill those three officer positions and that was it. And then some of them, you know, seem to have dozens of members uh, at certain times. Yeah, yeah, there, there. Um, in addition to um, to those things, uh, the also in Ancestry.com, you can get uh, marriage and birth certificate and uh, death certificate information, and sometimes that can help verify. I mean, the census is much more direct because they always, whether it's right or not, they'll put down a race. 
and uh, from some of the other uh, records, you don't necessarily in ancestry you don't necessarily get race, uh, or uh, you do get some age there. Um, but there are, and then the historical newspapers, the black newspapers are just fabulous, and there's so many of them digitized. But we did find poor Carl um, found that um, the uh, return on investment of time can be very difficult. Um, but we did find, well, say, for example, Eva Dean is mentioned like 51 times in various historic black, uh, one of the black newspapers is a Wisconsin newspaper, Wisconsin Blade. But she was mentioned multiple times. It may not mention that she was in the WCTU. It may not mention where she was from or something like that. So this, the newspapers are like um, a little bit down on the list of where we can find names and verifications. Oh, oh another thing about age, we have found a number, a lot of uh, examples of mothers and daughters working in a union and the mother and their mother works in the, is in the president, and then you see the daughter come in, or sometimes the daughter might be in charge of the young people's branch. So it can be a family, you know, sort of a family affair, and that, that gets the ages, uh, gets a little bit towards the ages. Great, thank you, Janet. Um, I think we've covered most of the, almost all of the questions in the chat, and so people have been sharing different resources also. Um, so I have this chat and I also encourage everyone to, I'm going to put emails for Janet and for me in the chat. Um, if anyone has any further resources they want to share with us or want to share with participants um, in an email, um, please email us. Um, also, if you have further questions, feel free to reach out. Um, we can, I can forward your inquiry along to Janet, Carl, and Adam or anyone uh, who can answer your question. Um, so thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, Janet, do you have any final words before I stop our recording? Oh, of course I do. First, I want to thank Carl and Adam again for taking the time from your busy schedules to uh, reflect on your uh, work at the archives because you've been, I mean, the, the, as I was saying, the dynamism is just such a, a great aspect to this kind of research when, and as you discuss things and figure things out, whether we're working out how to uh, how to gather the information consistently or whether we're trying to say, well, where else could we find something? Um, just the teamwork thing is is wonderful. And that reminds me to say that we are, as just to repeat what Fiona said, we'd be delighted to connect with you if you have comments, suggestions, questions about the workings of the project. And, um, you know, as I said, this is a long-term project. It's a lot of work. Um, and you know, we welcome sort of the general participation as we make it, we work to make a resource that's going to, we hope, be long lasting and very, very useful in, in um, advancing knowledge about Black women's lives. So thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I will stop here. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming.